Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, first of all, a, uh, a housekeeping uh, item. Um, I put the text, you know, the file that, uh, that we're using of the text, I put it in the chat. So if anybody wants to uh, download their own copy, please feel free. Uh, I also want to say that um, I heard from someone who watched the recording of last week's session. And in the recording, the text was a little bit blurry. So if anybody's watching this on the recording and can't read the text and would like a clear copy, just let me know and I can always, uh, you know, get it to you, uh, you know, in a non-recorded version. Uh, no, just, just uh, email me or send me a text or whatever and I can get you the text. All right. Um, with that, Put it back up on the screen. Is everybody Art is very clear today, the text. Okay. We're a bunch of clear people, what can I say? You know, for some reason when it's recorded, it, uh, I've, I've noticed that. But in any event, here it is. <coughs> Uh, um, I, I'll I'll download the file and I'll I'll put it in the next to the the recording so that it's there. It's a good idea. Okay. Uh, thank you. Anyway, um, to review what we've uh, our ongoing series, um, we've. Um, been dealing with this teshuva on the use of electricity and electronics on Shabbat. Uh, teshuva from the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards. Uh, it's a joint committee of the Rabbinical Assembly, United Synagogue, and the seminary. Um, and the beginning of the teshuva. Um, who is this? This is uh, Rabbi Nevins. He is, what am I doing here? Anyway, he's, we're starting out by defining what it is um, that's, that's a new, what, what is it that we worry about on Shabbat? Um, in that the whole the whole, uh, you know, let's say the whole issue of, of what we do or don't do on Shabbat is determined by how we define the, the concept of malacha. Uh, the Torah tells us that in several places that we should not perform malacha. Um, and the Teshuvah showed a couple places in the biblical text, which is summed up right here. Um, the command not to perform Malachan on Shabbat is repeated just before the section detailing the command to build the tabernacle. The rabbis understand this juxtaposition to indicate the primacy of Shabbat over tabernacle project and also to limit the scope of Malacha forbidden on Shabbat. Uh, to limit the scope to those acts involved in the tabernacle. In the tractate Chagiga, the rabbis explain that Malacha is category limited to Malacha, Malacha Machshevet, actions intended for the same purpose as their equivalent activities in the tabernacle. Modern Bible scholars have observed that the institution of Shabbat rose in prominence following the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE and came to be seen as a symbol of the entire covenant at that time. 
Whereas the festivals required a physical center for full ritual observance, the Shabbat could be observed anywhere, including in exile. Um, what that means is that all the festivals, the main activity, at least in terms of the biblical text, is the bringing of the sacrifice to the temple. Um, and that the observance of the festival did center around the activities at the temple. But Shabbat is, it did not require, even though there are sacrifices that are listed for Shabbat, the idea of ceasing from Malacha was not restricted to just stopping everything and going over to the temple. Okay. Any questions about that part? Okay, now we'll move on to now getting into the rabbinic sources. You know, the rabbis were not satisfied with just what was in the biblical text. So they had to still define exactly what is malacha. The biblical materials alone do not suffice to explain how exactly one might observe this day. Into the void steps the Mishnah and Shabbat, proclaiming a list of 40 less one primary categories of forbidden labor. Okay, uh, there is a, the, uh, a copy of the Mishnah. Um, I'm not going to go, I'll, I'll read the summary rather than go through the, the whole list of 39. And when we go through and try to analyze this list of 39 activities, we see that they can be broken into five different functions. One to 11, the production of bread. In other words, the sowing, plowing, uh, gathering into sheaves, thrash, you know, et cetera, and so forth. Um, from 12 to 24, the production of clothing. 25 to 33, hunting and preparing hides as parchment for writing. And 34 to 38, the construction of tools and shelter. And 39, the transportation of goods. Um, we may summarize the list by stating that the rabbinic understanding of Malacha regards the transformation of material reality to serve the needs of civilized people for food, clothing, writing, shelter, and tools. Okay. Any questions or problems with that list? Is that a, is that a, was that considered a comprehensive list? Um, well, I think, no. I, I'm gonna answer no to that. Um, is, the, is the statement at the end of that highlighted paragraph, is that sort of a comprehensive summary? Because and you can't, you're not supposed to play musical instruments on Shabbat, but you're not, you're not transforming material reality. Well, uh, I, I think what this is just saying, first of all, what this is saying is it's just summarizing what's in the Mishnah, the 39 activities. Now, uh, there was a term here that I kind of passed over, and let me go back because. Um, in the other highlighted one here, it says, it's a list of 40 less one primary categories of forbidden labor or avot melachot. The avot here is the, um, the particular word I'm going, the phrase I'm going for. In other words, these primary categories uh, as being avot, uh, 
and imahot, uh, also have children in the sense that there are derivative categories. So that's why I would say it is not a, a, a comprehensive listing. Okay, but it's really, I think it starts off, it's, it's a start because what it does do is it takes the activities that were either directly enumerated in the biblical text or those that were derived by association. Like it says that the, the prohibition against Malacha was juxtaposed to the activities of the building of the Mishkan. So they take those activities out and they've added, you know, other places and other sources and come up with this list. But it is not evident how the early rabbis of the Talmud transitioned from the Torah's rather vague prohibitions of Malacha to this detailed list. But they, they did pull it out. Remember, um, we have from the biblical times until the time of the mission, over how many hundreds of years it is to develop this, this understanding. And then a couple hundred more years until the rabbis of the Talmud got a hold of it. So they had a whole bunch of different ways. So even though I'm skipping over a couple questions that he raises on this list, the view that the banned Shabbat labors were derived from the tabernacle labors came to dominate uh, rabbinic thought. In the Yerushalmi, you know, the, um, there's two versions of the Talmud, the Babylonian and the Jerusalem Talmud. So the, um, the, the Talmud Yerushalmi says, All of the principal categories of labor were learned from the tabernacle. But in the Babylonian Talmud, it states that any labor not performed in the tabernacle cannot be considered to be one of the archetypes. Indeed, the Torah itself links Shabbat to the tabernacle with the expression, with the expression uh, et Shabbatai, Shabbatai tishmaru mikdashai tiru aniyarunai. Guard, guard my Sabbaths and revere my sanctuary, I am the Lord. We may think of the Sabbath as a mirror image of the tabernacle. The tabernacle is built through 39 discrete actions. The Sabbath is built through 39 discrete inactions. Okay. Is that uh, understandable? So, Without going, you know, we could ask, does the, um, does the building of the tabernacle involve uh, making garments? Does it involve making food? The answer is yes, uh, because there were, uh, there were adornments in the, in the tabernacle, the different clothing, First of all, the, the robes of the priests, uh, the curtains and other um, coverings, you know, for tables and other things. Yes, yeah, so there was, there was clothing and certainly food <clears throat> in the sense that uh, I would argue that making, uh, you, know, you know, killing and roasting the uh, various sacrifices is definitely making food. But there were also meal offerings that were brought and all that involved cooking and preparing the food. Okay. How are we doing here? You guys are too quiet today. All right, so I have a question. <clears throat> so are you saying that that because um, <clears throat> the tabernacle involved <coughs> clothing, that <clears throat> that is that allowed or forbidden? 
No, I'm saying that in this list yeah. of the 39 activities, we see it starts off the production of, of, of bread, <laughs> uh, the production of clothing. You know, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, if we would first just think of the building of a, of a tabernacle, we would consider uh, the production of food and clothing to be a part of that construction. Um, so I'm saying, yes, there were activities and items in the Mishkan that required uh, food and clothing and therefore could be put into this list. So well, there, so were, there, were cur there were curtains, right? I mean, I, I remember the, during Yom Kippur, the Torah reading talks about the curtain and drops of blood behind the curtain. So right. that covers clothing. Well, also the, the vestments that the priests wore. So yeah, th there's definitely, you know, you know, cloths there. Art, what was your question? So, so work here is being defined as anything necessary that was necessary to build a tabernacle. Is that, is that what's being said? So far, what I'm saying is okay. we're looking at the development of the term malacha. We're, we're far from being finished. Oh, okay, okay. Um, what I'm saying is starting off with the, uh, the rabbi started off by first looking at what does the Torah say. The association of the, of the appearance of the word malacha usually is with in, in, very close to the passages that describe the work in the Mishkan. So therefore, the, the rabbis of the Mishnah derived this list of 39 forbidden activities on Shabbat mm -hmm. from that juxtaposition of the work that was involved in building the Mishkan. Right, so, so just looking at, at the Mishkan, you're already up to 39, right? Correct. Okay. Which, which, um, which are now being summarized into, uh, well, we had the, uh, the summary back here, which was production of bread, production of clothing, hunting and preparing hides, uh, construction of tools and shelter, transportation of goods. Okay, so those that becomes the 39 um, principles, overriding principles of how to define malacha. Okay. As I say, we're far from done because now we get to the derivative labors. Okay. Um, the, the rabbis use the expression av malacha, you know, the primary category. And then they had the derivatives, which were called toldot. You know, remember the word toldot, uh, Ela toldot Noach, these are the generations of Noach. It means generation, the offspring. So we have the general principle, and now we're getting into the different offspring. Um, e each of the 39 gets its own 39. Uh, I think you get more than that. It produced the uh, list of 39 told of for each of the 39 of them. Okay, but... Um, 39 by 39 squared? That's what it looks like. Here, it says in the Talmud Yerushalmi, we read Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Shimon ben Lachish studied the topic for three and a half years and produced a list of 39 told out for each 39 I vote. 1,521. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Now, these derivatives do resemble the primary categories in their physical function, purpose, or result. Uh, one example of a, of, of a tolda is, a watering, is watering plants that is forbidden as a derivative of the primary category of sowing seeds. Okay? No, I water my plants to save a life. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to jump down to the next paragraph where he says, for our purposes is immaterial, whether Malacha is said to be involved in the use of electricity is, oh, wait, that's not what I was looking for. All right, but anyway, he says, since, since originally the question, yeah. Go ahead, Doug. Before you go there, if we could back up a little bit. What what was the reason for developing the toldot? Because I think the answer to that question speaks to the way it needs to be interpreted today. Well, I I think the uh, the reason for developing it is exactly what David asked, in that um, is this a comprehensive list? And I think anybody who looks at it will say, of course not. And, you know, and therefore we we need more. Well, I mean, were they were they inspired by a, a, a sense that um, created in the original thirty nine, or was it that they realized that in terms of the activities that people were were um, involved in that some of them came dangerously close to the to the to the border of the of the melacha, uh, of the avod, and and therefore needed to be included. Um, I would say definitely the latter, but I'm not sure exactly. Give me the first part of the question. Yeah, I mean, did they did they feel that that the the original list of thirty nine really wasn't didn't represent um, the full scope of activities that that are um, inherently included, and it, I, I would, it just would, failed to be enumerated originally. I would say both. I think that there are elements of, yes, not everything is included, and elements of, you know, we can look at some activities and we have to decide, you know, which category of work does it fall under. Um, you know, and since, since the original purpose of, of this uh, teshuva was to decide on the use of electricity and electronics, um, where does electricity fall into all these things? Okay. Thank you. The original teshuva on electricity um, talked about its similarity to the um, to fire. So now, what what aspect of fire caused electricity to be to be eliminated? Was it the uh, creation of light? Was it at the expenditure of fuel or the creation of heat? Take your choice. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, yeah, it, it's, you know, as life went on, there was a realization that uh, there was more to life than just building a Mishkan. And that certain activities have to really be, or should be pegged. So anyway, that was, uh, that was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That, I think that went into all the thinking. And remember, you know, like, uh, like I was saying, you know, what we're looking at here is we're jumping around by hundreds of years where there was plenty of time. I'm getting some other sounds coming back. 
Is there? I think Arlene. Yeah, so Arlene I'm is not on mute. I'm not on mute either. Okay, is it better now? Was I the only one getting that noise? Okay, in any event, um, the, um, what was I saying? I, you know, we had all these years of what they had to really understand uh, that you just couldn't limit or, or all these years to deal with the issue of how you define malacha and every time you try to come up with a, um, a comprehensive definition, you find that it doesn't work. Um, and especially, I think, in, in modern times, where every time that we think we could come up with a definition, somebody comes up with a new invention, uh, and we say, uh, does this fit into one of our categories or not? Or can we make... Uh, some dance around uh, the halacha proscriptions and, and accept it. And then Art would jump up and said, well, hey, if we're gonna accept it, why did we eliminate it in the first place? Which is what got us started in uh, this whole discussion. Am I right? Yes, Art would say exactly that. <laughs> okay, but even so, the um, we can get into, I'm just going to go quickly through some of these derivatives because it will take forever. Um, first, we have the intentional labor. Here we go. Understanding both the physical and psychological impact of each activity involving electricity on Shabbat. Uh, Anyway, that's what we're talking about here. So, four categories of intention significant to the laws of Shabbat. Unintended and unanticipated malacha. If a person performs a permitted act on Shabbat, knowing that it's possible, but not inevitable that a malacha may result from his or her activity, such action is permitted despite the unintended consequence. Okay, now he uses the example of pulling a chair across a dirt floor where, you know, when you tilt back a chair and it's on two legs, all the weight on the two legs is going to create a rut in the, uh, in the sand and therefore that's plowing. He said, no, let's not worry about that. Uh, yeah, okay, I, hey, you know, let it out. Um, it's going to get better. Uh, in other words, what we're saying here is that you have one action that could be permitted, um, causes something that may or may not be, but we're going to say, okay, it's all right, because that's not your intent. Uh, by the way, I'm leaving out here the whole issue if you're dragging that chair from one domain to another domain. Because if you take that chair across your dirt floor inside the house and take it into your garden, you've got a different, a different problem. So more... <clears throat> I, th I think this introduces the concept of relativity in, in uh, Shabbos observance. That if you if you are a very aware person and knowledgeable and smart and alert, you can anticipate some of the consequences. Whereas if you're not, then you're, you you won't ant anticipate the consequences. But this sounds as if so. If I can't anticipate the consequences, I'm not violating anything. So, which would make a lot of these rules relative, no? Or care carelessness is okay. Bliss, ignorance is bliss, has that? Right. <laughs> well, don't mind that rut you're creating. It's, <laughs> don't plan to avoid a rut. What rut? Wait a minute, this is only the first, the first, uh, the first category. 
Um, you know, I'm going to look at it and say that the rabbis all along had a, had a sense of, um, you know, we're dealing with human activity. And human activity is variable. Um, you know, and are we going to be that hard-nosed that we're going to sit and yell and scream about anything that you could possibly do on Shabbat? Uh, if so, why don't we just stay in bed and say the ideal way of dealing with Shabbat is take it up on the rest, you know, uh, you know, stay in bed, don't even throw the cover off because that might involve some type of malacha. With 1,521 possible violations, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I don't think 1,500 is a comprehensive list. <laughs> oh, well, okay. All the more reason. You know, let's go up to 5,000. I don't care. No, I, I, you know, I mean, all right. I mean, you know, the, it, this is what it is, you know, and I think in going through this right now, let's just look and say, and, and see what the rabbis talked about and whether we want to find that applicable to what we're doing or what we can or should do, let's leave that in abeyance until we get through the list. Is that fair? Fair. Yes, that's fair. I, you know, <laughs> rabbis, fair. rabbis writing in different <laughs> times in different places, um, or any individual writing in different times in different places, have different motivations, uh, different reasons for writing what they write. Um, and we have different reasons for adapting what they wrote, which may be different from the reasons that they wrote it for in the first place. All of which is God inspired, of course. Okay. Secondly, unavoidable malacha. If a person performs an action on Shabbat for permitted purpose, but knows that it is inevitable that a beneficial malacha will result from the activity, such action is deemed by the rabbis to be forbidden by biblical law as unavoidable and as an unavoidable and beneficial consequence. So the classic example, a man wants to give a child a chicken head to play with on Shabbat. He cuts off the head, not intending to kill the chicken per se, but if you cut off its head, will it not die? Okay, I'm not sure we want to get into this one, do we? God. Okay. Don't these guys have anything better to do? Well, if they, they did, we wouldn't have anything to study. Yeah. <laughs> they spent all that time in bed thinking. Yeah, yeah. or sleeping. Okay. It's clear to me that Hasbro is missing an opportunity here. Yes. <laughs> all right. Unavoidable and undesirable, Malacha. Similarly, if a person intends to perform a permit perform a permitted act on Shabbat, knowing it is inevitable and malacha will result from the activity, except he will receive no benefit from this result and may suffer a loss. Many authorities permit the, uh, the action, though some Ashkenazi post scheme rule stringently. Naturally. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I don't think any of these everybody agrees with entirely. Okay, and lastly, we have an intentional act from for, but for a purpose different from the malacha. Finally, if a person intentionally performs a malacha on Shabbat, but for a permitted purpose unrelated to its forbidden result, this is subject to debate. Ah. Okay. In the Talmud, Rabbi Shimon considers such an act to be permitted, whereas Rabbi Yehuda forbids it. Later authorities mostly side with Rabbi Shimon's leniency, ruling that such an action is not banned by the Torah, but they nevertheless 
expand it by force of rabbinic decree. Okay. The case refers to a man who digs a hole on Shabbat, which is normally forbidden, as either the malacha of digging or building, depending on whether the hole is inside or outside the home. In this case, however, the man's interest is not in producing a hole, but in, but in gathering some dirt. Rabbi Shimon permits it, whereas Rabbi Yehuda forbids it. In the, in the end, even Rabbi Yehuda permits this because in this case, the act of digging, digging is considered to be uh, calcul, destructive, since it leaves an unhelpful and even hazardous hole in the field or floor. While the majority view that such a malachah does not violate the biblical ban, the rabbis prohibited it of their own authority. So let me get this straight. <clears throat> if it's beneficial, you can't do it. But if it's destructive, you can do it. No. <laughs> That's what it says. It, it That's is what, what it says. It says. Well, there's, I mean, there's, there's a kind of a logic to that. I mean, if, if the, if the original notion was, was, you know, the beginning of, of, of Bereshit, and what we're talking about is resting from creative work, then destructive work doesn't fall within that. Yeah. So we should all go out and do destructive things on Shabbos. Hey, the the new Shabbos mo model is uh, motto is uh, helter skelter. <laughs> well, there's a lot of there's a lot of internal inconsistency in in this concept of destruction with those things that are described with you know what impact it would have if you do something. And uh, I think I forget where it was above, but there were some other, there, there are some instances where if you do something, it has an effect on, on some item, which would be uh, similar to what you would do if you were to have actually worked on the item. And that's, that's not permitted, but others are permitted. I mean, I don't think you can, I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's easy to follow a logical path here. Well, let, let's take, you know, the, the, the hypothetical I raised originally, which was knitting on Shabbos, <clears throat> that if you're going to knit, and the only time you can knit is between Friday sundown and Saturday sundown, and you're knitting to, you're knitting things for homeless people. Um, that's clearly forbidden here, right? Because it would accrue to somebody's benefit. The creative work. Creative work, and it would accrue to somebody's benefit. What if you were, what if you were going to knit and use that as some kind of, uh, you know, loose weapon or object, you know, like uh, use it to choke somebody, not kill them, but just, you know, if there was some destructive purpose in your knitting, would that be okay then? I, I, I'm, I'm having trouble with the logic too. Wait, where are we saying that that destructive work is okay? Uh, it. it it said it um the bottom of d d the bottom of d was it b yeah yeah bottom of b back up a little bit yeah this is here d right here no b b no but it's oh, d, also d. bottom of d as in david d. Uh, d d d the bottom of d it says it right there yeah the yeah, act of digging yeah. is destructive and it's permitted. But then the rabbis prohibited it. It says in the end. Oh, wait, no, 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 wait. wait, we, we got to put that back in contact. I think you guys are looking at it wrong. <laughs> right. What they're saying here, what Rabbi Yehuda says. Remember, the example here was a guy who dug a hole. Right. Right. Now his purpose was not to dig the hole, his purpose was to get some dirt. 
Now, I don't know why you need a pile of dirt on Shabbat, but we'll leave that. That uh, was my question. Uh, but the fact is that for some reason, getting this pile of dirt was a, was a um, acceptable activity. And, and that's productive. And I don't want to use the word productive. That was a positive act. Now, in, cre in getting that positive act, we created a destructive act because you wound up with a hole, right? Now, what the, what the rabbis, are, the other rabbis are saying, you know, digging that hole was destructive. And therefore, even though we said before it was permitted because it resulted in something positive, we really should say be, that it isn't permitted, and therefore the rabbinic decree says no. No. Okay, sorry. It says because it says that rabbi. It says ra the the whole digging and gathering of dirt. Rabbi Shimon permits the act. Rabbi Yehuda forbids it, almost. Oh. And then he said, in the end, even Rabbi Yehuda permits this because, in this case, the act of digging is considered destructive. So it's being destructive is what makes it permissible, according to Rabbi Yehuda and apparently others. Bizarre. The rabbis prohibited it because they couldn't figure out the logic behind the distinction. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I, I think we have to go back and look up what Rabbi Yehuda really said there, and I didn't do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're looking not only at, at, at an interpretation through the translation, but an interpretation of the interpretation and probably of another interpretation. So um, let me make, I'll make a note of that. Um, D, it's Shabbat 73. Okay. I will, I'll have to go back and clarify that. But <laughs> you know, per permits us because in case they do destructive senses. I mean, it's, it's a question of, I was a question, what does it mean that he permits this? It's, he's permitting digging the hole. I, we'll have to go back and check that out. And, and, and leave that for next time. Um, all right, let me, I want to just go through these highlighted parts, and, you know, and then uh, because then we're getting to the, um, yeah, I've got it. the whole crux. Um, because as it says here, when we want to talk about intentionality, it's going to be very significant when dealing with electricity. To summarize this introductory discussion, in order to establish that a given action is biblically prohibited as malacha, one must show that the act is physically comparable or has comparable intentions and results to one of the primary categories or its derivatives or derivations. Absent such results and intentions, the act may still be forbidden by the authority of the rabbis, but will not be considered biblically prohibited. Rabbinic prohibit prohibitions are generally binding, but they bear lesser penalties and may be superseded by competing halachic values. As we will see in section three, we now consider various categories of malacha and their applicability, the operation of electric. Okay. So, what he is summarizing here is first, when we want to look at an activity on Shabbat, first we look and say, say, is it directly related to one of the 39 categories? 
you know, yes, yes or no. If we say yes, okay, no further discussion. If we say no, we'll say, well, can we get it out of the one of derivatives? Okay, yes or no. If it's yes, again, end the discussion. Um, but is it borderline derivative? And therefore the rabbis had to go at it like the whole, which we need to clarify. Um, and therefore they may have prohibited. And that, and then that comes down to what are, are the community norms that are gonna be involved in all of this? How, how does the community, the congregation really deal with this? And, and what are we gonna do as a community in approaching it? Okay. Okay. I, David, is that a question coming? I can't tell. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying that's okay. And I actually have to jump off now. But yeah, well, we're getting yeah, to, I'm, we're getting I, to jump off anyway. But I just want to use that as a summary, and we'll pick up at this point uh, next week. Oh, at, at the rate we're going, we're at page fifteen out of out of fifty-seven. So we have a few weeks to mull this over. That's if all you, right. If you'd like, uh, if if you'd like some interesting reading between now and then on the subject of Shabbat. Read if you have a copy of the Sidur Sim Shalom, and it's probably otherwise available. Um, in the Kabbalah Shabbat service, there are sources for study and reflection. Shabbat um, 12, 12, 1. I mean, it, it's, it's some of the most interesting. Like, if you can't build a ramp to walk off a ship. But if a Gentile builds a ramp, you can use it to walk off the ship, even if you build it on Shabbat. Uh, for another time, sorry. For another time. Um, I would just say, I would just say, who's telling the Gentile to build it? If you tell him to build it, it's no good. It actually says that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so we're, we're, I am going to miss. Go ahead, Jenny. No, Jenny, go ahead. I'm just going to say, unfortunately, I have a doctor's appointment next Monday morning, so I am going to miss a bit of this, uh, for which I am really sorry. Uh, I mean, I may not care in terms of what I do, but this is really interesting. So, uh, so long, people. Uh, just remember, it will be recorded. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so, it so more going back to the to the digging a hole, the destructive versus constructive. It, 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 am I clear? Am I am I correct in understanding that if a Jew may not build the statue of Robert E. Leo in Shabbat, he can tear it. Doug, no, your sound faded out, so I didn't hear you. Oops. Yeah, I was, I was saying is understanding that a Jew may not build a statue of Robert E. Lee on Shabbat, but he can tear one down. No, he can't, because it would be a benefit. <laughs> um, um, actually, he can't tear it down because presumably that statue is so big that it's outside and there's no air roof. So you can't do it. Well, okay, so I, I understand that, but how about, how about if it was in Philadelphia and rather than Robert E. Lee, it was our former mayor? Again, it's outside. Oh, actually, that statue was inside the A-roof. Yeah. City Hall is inside the A-roof, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I, I don't want to comment on this, on this destructive <laughs> deduction because I got to go back and clarify it. So um, 
I, I'm, I'm not going to jump in on that right now, Doug. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Mort. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Thank that's you, Mort. And Helter Skelter. <laughs> well, see, as there's a, there's a, the trick is what we really haven't done is to find when is Shabbat. Because oh, we boy. could say, even though if it's noon here, someplace in the world it's after Shabbat. Oh, my. I'm not going to start that up. Let's, let's, let's call it a day. All right, everybody. Stay cool. Stay cool and stay dry tomorrow. Yep. Yeah.